Good morning. It's good to have you all with us. It's been an eventful week. We had wonderful guests with us for the week, and uh, some of them aren't feeling so well, leaving some of the others of us not feeling so well. I will try to get through this this morning. Thanking God for the grace of God, I woke about three, I was working on my sermon, finishing it up, and I had water at that point, about five o'clock, we had none. And so thanking God for road men or, or town borough people that were able to uh, get the water running by about 6 or so or 6.30. And let's just say Tony and team had a frenzy in the kitchen this morning trying to figure out what in the world we were going to do without water. And 35 people and nothing that was flushable. So anyhow, an eventful day to be full of joy. Usual joy. Last week we played with Psalms 85 and 10. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And so often we look at the dichotomy and the polarity between truth and mercy or righteousness and peace. And yet, if we read the Scriptures fully, we realize that there's a third component of meeting and kissing. And it's about relationship between God and us and between us and other people. When I know the truth, let me show mercy. As we think about the Scriptures, I want to paint a picture of holiness. This week we were playing with uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 16 says, in, uh, during broken bread, Be holy because I am holy. You'll find the same context in Leviticus and also in Exodus. But this concept of God being holy, righteous, and fearful... And when we think of the people of God and those that followed him, we can think about the story of Job. It says after his sons and daughters had feasted, he would go and he would sacrifice or he would consecrate them because he was concerned they may have sinned or fallen away from God. And if we look at this story, preliminary story that uh, you read so well, Lisa, this story of Elizabeth meeting Mary, I'd like us to have a backstory to this encounter. You see, Zacharias was a priest, or Zechariah was named a priest. That would be John the Baptist's father, and that would be Elizabeth's husband. But if we look back on the story of the, of the temple worship, Look back on the story or the process of temple worship. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies to do his sacrifice. And they tied a rope around his waist because if an unholy person walked into the Holy of Holies, God would strike them dead. And so if somebody else followed them in to rescue them, they feared that they would die as well. And so if things went wrong, they had this rope to pull them out. I'm not joking. And there was this fear and there was this trepidation as you go into the Holy of Holies to worship, to offer the atonement blood and the incense as the sacrifice is being sacrificed out front of the temple. That God in His holiness was holding each person accountable, and Zechariah, knowing all of this, I believe, had consecrated himself fully before the Lord. And he made sure that his wife was holy as well because he didn't want any impurities because he wanted to come out walking. 
I think you get the picture. And so my guess is that Zechariah was a person who walked around with people that were pious, holy, righteous, and had it all together. Now, he didn't have to worry about his children like Job, because after all, he had none. His wife was barren. But as he went into the temple that day and offered the incense offering, offered the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, more than likely Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, Kippur, something like that. He encountered an angel, and, and the angel Gabriel said to him, Do not be afraid. Not a haphazard word for the man who is offering this atonement sacrifice, knowing that if you encounter God in this place and there's anything between you and God, you are gone. Gabriel says to him, do not be afraid. And so I believe that this holiness, this righteousness, this purity, this pharisaical kind of a purity concept was deep within the heart of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Let's not walk around with people that are messed up. And so I wanted this context as I thought about this story, I thought the background of this and the mindset of Zechariah and Elizabeth had to really influence the way they looked at life. This was the year Zechariah had offered sacrifice to God. And it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, think about this, six months after the Day of Atonement, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to the town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And later on the angel said to her, Just like Zechariah, do not be afraid. And Mary accepts the call of God. But Mary, in her diligence, goes off, and we read the story this morning. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried up to the town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth knows that no woman should be pregnant before they're married. Elizabeth has this mindset of holiness. She knows how things are supposed to be done. And yet somehow, Elizabeth in her grace, mercy, or anointing of the Holy Spirit begins to bless Mary, this unwed pregnant woman. How is it possible that a person of such holy standards and piety is able to look at her niece and say, blessed are you in the fruit of your womb. And all of this, and the baby leaps for joy in the work of the Holy Spirit. And my question for us this morning is, is it possible for us to look past the things that hinder us from experiencing what God may be doing in somebody else's life. We see a woman who is pregnant without a husband and our religious minds go running and we fail to bless the child. We experience other circumstances and we immediately put up this facade of holiness and separation because we don't want to be contaminated because we're afraid when we enter the Holy of Holies, we might not come out. 
And yet I dare say that the Holy Spirit is calling us to be filled with mercy and grace because God wants to bless that child. God wants to bless that circumstance in spite of the other things that are going on that look outside of what is expected. Can we allow the joy of the Lord to fill us even when it seems out of place? Can we be an Elizabeth during our family gatherings, during our times of getting together and we see situations that just make us cringe? And can we bless and say, Lord, bless this child. Bless this circumstance. Pour out your spirit in this situation that looks a bit unholy. Or maybe a lot. Can we be filled with unusual joy during this season? Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your joy would permeate in our hearts. That mercy and peace could come together and righteousness would dwell within us. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. For our song of response, it's not really a Christmas song, but it should be maybe. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Number 25 in your red book if you want to open it. The words again will be up here. Um, sing with us. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. God of glory, God of love.